shared some information about the work they're doing and obviously their desires continue going uh, going forward. Uh, be smart for kids and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I believe it's gun violence uh, and and gun uh, gun protection and then uh, Miss Omar Kill. Um, presentations tomorrow we have our. Um, our leadership, Hamilton County Schools. Uh, I see a new, I see a new board member. Uh, <laughs> Children's chapter. Children, that's right. Uh, but we have uh, uh, recognition of leadership, Hamilton County Schools. So that group will be finishing uh, tomorrow. Actually, will be their last session. Uh, they'll be going uh, working with Brent and Nakia and I guess myself a little bit on finance and budget. Uh, and then uh, they'll they'll just be before you as a as a wrap up, and then our uh, our monthly report, uh, future twenty twenty three, will be around accelerating uh, student achievement. And uh, Justin will kind of give an overview of the of the year as we enter uh, testing time. Uh, obviously, some of our schools begin T and ready today. Uh, others will uh, begin tomorrow, uh, and we'll continue with that. Uh, so with that. Um, I would turn it over to you all for items on approval of the consent agenda. Does anyone have any questions? So, so I'll start with field trips. Good with that. Okay. Uh, so you see, our our field trips all are. Um, None out of the country. Uh, all or most are athletic uh, connected, but there are several academic, uh, JROTC uh, as well. Um, so any questions about field trips? All right. Uh, bids and contracts. Uh, Christy, well, Brent, anything to uh, uh, you want to make the board aware of as we look at bids and contracts? May I ask a question here, sir? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I should say. Oh, ask the chair. <laughs> Uh, Christy or Ms. Goldberg, I guess, since Christy's not here. She's, yeah, she's not here. Okay. How are, are we on the overall budget? I mean, we're, we're approving things, and I mean, do we have an overall view of where we are? Could we, is there any way we could get a, a dollars and cents ballpark? Um, in the board packet, there is a month, monthly financial report that goes through February, okay. I believe, is the most recent. Um, you know, those are always about a month and a half behind, mostly because it takes that long for the revenue to come in and record it, plus all the recording of the expenses. Um, we are projected to be within budget um, and with all POs that we have open, PO requests and everything else. Right. I, I saw that. I'm referring to next year's budget. Are we looking at an overall projection yet or dollar figure? Thir yeah. So Thursday, uh, I think we have projected revenue available Thursday. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you. So we need any questions on bids or uh, contracts? Primarily maintenance related. Yeah, I, I would consider all these pretty fairly routine. I don't think there's anything to call out. I mean, unless there's questions. Um, I want to understand just what this Lookout Valley Middle High School contract is. It looks like, I mean, looks yeah. to me like we're going to be rewiring the building. Yeah, ben can explain it more than, uh, more than I can. Yeah, this is a complete rewire of the building. It's in pretty bad shape as far as infrastructure-wise from mm -hmm. a wiring standpoint. <clears throat> so we're going in and rewiring the whole thing. And also their intercom system is not working. We've got an intercom system bought for them that requires the wiring that we're getting ready to do okay. to be able to install it. So we've got the equipment. And then this also sets us up for one-to-one. -one. Right. Great. Every... Uh, well, I guess, yeah, all the high schools are going one-to-one. -one. But look how Valley's all going to be future-ready next year. 
Let, let me ask a question about the the, uh, the computers, if I can, Dr. Johnson. I did have one of my principals articulate that uh, for some reason the eighth graders maybe got some computers that were used this year. They are, are we going to are we going to take care of those used ones before we? Take care of high school. Yeah, we're going to work to take care of everybody. So here's here's what that principal is referring to. Um, so we we purchased Chromebooks to get every school, uh, every middle school student to one to one. Uh, next year we'll be pulling offline and always get this backwards. In 21s or 22s, in 22s. So we're working to get on a cycle. Uh, we're not quite on that cycle, but we're going to pull all the N22s off of, all, offline. Now, principals had some autonomy. Many of them chose to give them to eighth graders, the oldest device to eighth graders. Most of them did. Um, so any any of those devices that are in that eighth grade, if that's what they so chose, that are N22s, and that's just the that's just the model of the of the Chromebook. Uh, those would all come offline, and they'd be replaced with new devices. So we are working to get on a cycle, so that we're not in a situation where you have that big hit all at once. You can just budget and plan for it over time. Does Correct. The, does the device follow the key? You know, no. I'm the eighth grader, I'm going to the ninth grade. Does the device go with me or does it stay at the school? It, it'll, st it'll be returned to the school. Uh, so the, the students will turn their devices in at the end of the school year. So those eighth graders would get well, I think Ben can correct me if I'm wrong. We, I think we've decided that for high school, in any instance where they have to use some computers that already exist, those will go to 12th graders since they're going to be leaving the system. Um, so I think, is that what we decided? Yeah. So ninth graders will be receiving new devices. So if they're in eighth grade now with a used device, when they go to their high school next year, they would get a new device. How, how is that going? I mean, have we had to replace many, we've all stolen. I've, I, I don't even want to say how it's going because I'm, I'm scared to say because when you say it's going really well, it'll make it go. Um, but I'll just say this. Uh, Overall, so right before I got here, we were in the midst of implementation of grades 6 through 12, one-to-one -one implementation, and it took us a full year to prepare for implementation, and I credit Ben and that team, because uh, I, I guess we gave you all about two, three months. Um, should have told us that. Two, a month and a half. Uh, but I, I, haven't, I haven't received, and I hate to, I don't want to say this publicly, I haven't received a, a phone call, an email, uh, anything from a parent or anybody with questions or concerns at all. And then I'm impressed by the infrastructure piece. It's not that it's perfect across the system, but a lot of wi a lot of wiring had been done uh, even prior to my arrival that allowed the system to be able to handle uh, the amount of devices that are there. So it's one of those things that we'll continue to refine. And um, just very briefly, um, if you would, Ben, talk a little bit about what you've been doing with high school and that working group that's been coming around the table um, and, and how, how we're learning from this last implementation to even improve better on the second one. So we've met about twice, two or three times, and we've got another meeting scheduled for next week. Actually, we'll be meeting with the high school and the middle school one more time. The middle school will just be to cover those things that are going to be end of year. You had asked the point about do they stay with the, with the, does Chromebook stay with the student? It will when they're in that building. So sixth grade, they'll get assigned the same device when they become a seventh grader. But when they matriculate to a different school, and they have to get one from the from the new school, but everything seems to be going well. Uh, right now, we're in the midst of wiring for all the uh, uh, high schools, and we've only got we're doing Brainerd and Lookout Valley are our last two. Everything's wired. We're just on this uh, one of the board memos here. We're going to be buying buying the wireless access points, so that's what gives you the coverage. So it's all ready for the wireless access points. We just have to get them and stick them in, and we'll be doing that this summer. And so then they'll be able to handle all the devices that they get. Um, and to ask about the other question, I think, how many damages have we have we uh, reported? All stolen damages. Now, out of 9,000 devices that we bought last year, or 8,500, something like that, we've had 600 turned back in for warranty. 400 of those was due to damage. Um, and then we have a pool set up to where when it gets broke, they put it on UPS and send it up there. That we get, They get a new device by the next morning. And so then they have it to give to the, to the student. And then that's the loaner. That stays there. And that goes up in the pool. It gets fixed. And then it, it'll get reassigned to another, to another student whenever one gets broke. But 
so far, I'm trying to get numbers from our insurance company, but I don't know very many loss where they've lost or stolen it. That's the only time that they'd be on the hook for the whole amount of a Chromebook. So. Um, something that occurs to me uh, from going to the advisory groups, the teacher advisory groups that I participate in, um, is the amount of work that the technology coordinator at the school is now doing now that they have one-to-one -one devices. Um, so as we think about staffing for the technology department and or um, supplements, ding, ding, one more of them. Um, but I, it sounds like it's a tremendous amount of work to keep that many devices um, where they need to be. And yeah, so, so, um, so we actually been talking about this in conference a little bit, uh, very briefly, but there's no way that a teacher can, can manage that. Um, and so the reality is the first year or two, uh, it's a little bit easier because the devices are new. Uh, as you get into years three and four in particular, our techs um, are critical. So right now, with the way we're currently staffed for about every, um, for about every 4,000 devices, there's one technician. Uh, and so that's just that's that's um, that's too many. Uh, industry standard is about one to five hundred. Um, ideally, uh, you know, we want to get to a thousand, fifteen hundred. Um, and so we have, we did. Um, no Ken and, and Ben. Uh, we, redis we, we, we redistributed uh, the deployment of our techs uh, throughout the learning communities, and so there's what three-man teams in each learning community. Yeah, there's but, three in each one. Yeah, but that's it's still a massive undertaking for them at, at that level. And again, to your point, completely, um, it's something that we are continuing to um, to work through in the budget cycle, just because you can't you can't add the technology and not have the supports to be able to fix and repair as well as the infrastructure and wireless access points is uh, as Ben talked to spoke to. Are we still utilizing teacher facilitators with it for one block a day or supposedly? So there are some teachers that get a supplement for doing it, yes. Um, but the I guess the challenge is the just the sheer number of devices. It's gone from just you know their role is gone from just being the teacher go to to becoming now if I'm in a thousand student school there are a thousand devices and so it just gets overwhelming. I know my yes. brother did that at Saturday Daisy High School for a while. I know one night one of his one of his friends came and said, uh, "Gil, you got here early this morning." He said, "No, I've been working on computers all night." So he went home, took a shower, and came back to work that day. So I mean, it's it's being knows it's it's hard. We need to get more technicians. I'm not necessarily teacher technicians, but more technicians. Well, curiously, what's their pay scale? Do you know? Are they uh, are we competitive? So I guess what I'm saying. It's a grade 12. I mean, to me, we need to we need to bump that up and get some. I mean, just get better quality of, of people. But right now, it's about thirty thousand a year. So are we are we having trouble getting enough people or? Uh, we end up training for other businesses. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you that the Rock Point Learning Community really appreciates having assigned tech staff. They said how much they love knowing it's the same person that's coming back, that that's been, I think, a customer service plus for them. All right, I think we're on uh, item D. Bids, contracts. Uh, you see before you, feel free to speak, Justin, to us if you'd like to. Uh, Ron Clark, if there are any questions, Ron Clark Academy for, I believe it's East Ridge. Uh, high school that's looking at going to uh, Ron Clark, which is a pretty unique opportunity to be able to do. Clifton Hills as well. Um, any questions on uh, that opportunity that these schools are taking advantage of out of Title I funds? Yeah. And you see the monthly financial report um, in the current year uh, that's before you. Christie prepares each month. And budget amendments for fiscal year 19. 
that are here. Brent, anything you want to speak to in particular on here? It's a lot of cleanup. Yeah, this is uh, this is really just transfers between accounts so that we can um, charge expenses to the proper accounts. There's no positions or or any new new funding items. Just transfers between line items. It's only three pages, so there's nothing on the last page here, Rhonda. Zero positions. <laughs> our, is projections, projections for year end, or you're pretty much on track. I mean, we're uh, you're going to spend all you have. You're not going to have any put back in our pocket. Oh, well, we're not going to overspend. That's for sure. Um, that we'll we'll be within budget. <laughs> I would say um, uh, uh, historically we we've been under budget. Fiscally responsible uh, is uh, definitely what we've been and continue to be uh, even this year uh, as we go forward. I do think you know we all know that as we start to build the budget, some of the needs that have that we're even talking about with text to devices and such, they they they've been challenges and even infrastructure readiness um, with wireless access points and such. Those have been things that have been needs for some time and 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 we have to continue to accelerate in those in those areas but um, definitely work to be good stewards and and always stay within the budget <laughs> of whatever the budget is <laughs> So any, any specific questions about budget amendments, um, federal federal programs as well, uh, budget amendments, transfers and cleanups, anything in particular uh, Nikki or Brent or any board member have as questions? Yeah, the, again, this is the same thing. It's, it's all um, transfers between lines or um, updating the budget based on carryover and other amendments that we do from month to month. No positions, no new funds. And then the same with school nutrition. Uh, you see that there before you. Um, the same thing with, uh, with cleanup. And speaking of positions, we've got the updated policy 5.101. Couldn't have been planned any better. Uh, <laughs> I said, uh, policy 5.101. Uh, I think, but I think I know Dr. Highlander uh, shared some concerns about some things being put in. And just to read all existing staff, I don't know if everybody has. Everybody have a policy in front of you. I won't read it. If oh man, my gosh, thank you. I believe Scott helped us wordsmith this. Sherry, is there any way to um, blow it up, enlarge that a little bit, and still keep it on the screen? I need any carrots. Wow. Be able to get rid of that bar. <laughs> I was trying to be considerate of others. <laughs> what what about you? Season, season. Bears off his head.
questions? All right. Is this? I've I've lost track. Is this first read, second read on that? Second read. All right. All right. Um, Keith, any comment on the uh, sick leave bank trustee recommendation? So I want to make sure I understand what to anticipate with this. I haven't received any name under a separate cover. We will get it on Thursday. Okay. Different than the student behavior issues. Okay. All right. I'll defer to you, Dr. Bradshaw, if you will, on uh, Howard work-based learning. Yes, the city um, would like to move forward with this partnership with our Howard Work-Based Learning Program. Um, three things they're going to do with this MOU is provide an outreach facilitator um, to work closely with the students, monitor the program, assist with mentors. The second, they will provide transportation through CARTA and um, through our transportation services as well. And thirdly, um, they would like to develop 25 paid part-time positions or internships for our students. So um, the first MOU was for the facility over at the rec center, um, but this is just to enhance the overall work-based learning program at Howard. Questions on that? Really, what's the city investment? Dollars. I can't give you a specific dollar amount, but they're just really interested in supporting Howard. I, I'm thankful they are, you know, very much so. What basically what are our financial responsibilities and what are theirs? Um, it's kind of clear there. They they just want to support us. Um, they provided the location and just working close jobs and the partner we provide some of the transportation they provide some is that right yes sir just to enhance the overall program yeah 50 car to bus passes are included yeah sorry i didn't have my nope, computer nope. with me so that's no why problem. i had to ask well it's agenda we don't have to be totally ready yet. true okay. true Study. <laughs> yeah thank you dr Bradshaw. yes sir Any uh, comment, Dr. Bradshaw, on uh, the uh, tuition rate recommendations, the general uh, uptick, right? Yes, sir. The state formula has changed, which caused an increase um, of out-of-county and out-of-state tuition. Out-of-county, about a 4% increase. Out-of-state, a little bit over 5%. So it's pretty much out of our control. Yes, I do. So funny thing for out of county and out of state is that if this bill passes, you'll just be able to actually get paid to not attend Hamilton County schools if you don't have to live in Hamilton County. But you could get a, a voucher. So you might want to clarify, Jenny, how that works, because I see some eyes trying to understand sure, what is sure. you referring so, to. Um, you know, here we are talking about if we were to welcome students to Hamilton County, which uh, Hamilton County schools are the fastest improving in the state of Tennessee, so we would want to welcome them. Um, but the way that this new voucher bill um, is set to work, there are no requirements for a student to actually live in Hamilton County for any length of time or maintain residency in Hamilton County. So be able to actually um, move into Hamilton County stay long enough to get an address, maybe a library card if you live in the city. Um, but the city actually does check that address every year when you go to re-up your library card. Um, this bill does not require any of that. Um, you could take your voucher, which would be worth about $6,800, and um, move. And Hamilton County would pay K-12 for you to go to school. So it's just an interesting little bit of economics that we'll get to play with. Thank you. Um, so definitely a, a key point within that bill. 
other two items. Hold, hold on just a minute while we're on that. Scott, what is the latest on that? I know we got the, my phone was blowing up this morning at 8 o'clock. All this back and forth. Uh, where are we on that? I think Jenny's probably, the, I'm sorry, I think Miss Hill's probably. Well, I know because they were trying to type some loose ends. I spent about, oh, 45 minutes talking to Bo Watson about this a couple of Saturdays ago. Uh, so uh, trying to figure out some of the loopholes that were in there. And this was one of the things that we discussed. And that's one reason that some of the people weren't forward if they typed some of those loose ends. Of course, mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to go away. So um, where, where are they on that right now? So the most recent amendment was moved forward in the Senate um, last week, and that will be what the Senate Finance Committee will be looking at this week. Um, the Senate's bill took away some of the loophole coverage that the House bill actually had added in. Um, the Senate bill adds 15,000 more students, so it caps out the program at 30,000 students. Um, the Funding remains the same. The reimbursement years one through three remains the same. Um, they have added back in um, homeschool and also a laundry list of things that you can use the voucher money for or the ESA money for. So um, that would include transportation, um, uniforms, books, um, technology purchases, which was one of the big conversations about loopholes because purchases are unaccounted for, really. You're given a, a Visa gift card, so um, you could take your child out now, especially now that homeschool's back in, you could take your child out and buy a, a car um, and say it's transportation to get them to and from school. Um, and uh, anyway, so that piece is in the Senate version of the bill. They have, the House bill had added in some language um, about sports participation, um, where you couldn't participate in sports at a private school if you had participated in a public school the year prior. Um, that has been removed from the Senate bill, so we've got the sports piece, which some people fear could lead to sports recruiting. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see what else. There well, is still. They don't do that now, by the way. But <laughs> yeah, now they. What's so do so do public schools, but that's yeah. okay. Go ahead. Uh, but, but there is a fear. It's, it's it's open game. Yeah, yeah, but there is a there is a concern, of course, then that if if a child who otherwise could not afford to attend a private school um, then had essentially a coupon that then. Yeah. Could be matched with a sports, uh, with a need-based yeah. scholarship, right for sports. Um, we've got the residency. There is no residency requirement, so um, the only requirement is that you live in Hamilton County basically when you get the voucher. But there's no long-term requirement there. Um, there's also um, nothing that sets a specific percentage of number of vouchers for a given um, part of the state or county or system. So when I've done my numbers, I've just used a quarter because if you had a large, um, you know, as Shelby County was terrified or very concerned that they might end up with somebody coming in using all the vouchers for them. So I thought, well, conservatively, let's use what if a quarter of them happened here. Um, Something that shocked me that had, that had not occurred to me until this last version passed, though it's always been the, the reality, there is no out for a school system once a school system is in. So if a school system has three or more schools in the bottom 10% of the state for performance, that system then is included in the voucher program or the ESA program. And there is never a way for that school system to get off the list. Um, so, and there's not a sunset for this program as it's not a trial program. Um, let me pull up my email too and make sure. Well, I've just, I, like I said, I talked to Bo quite some time and he told me some of his concerns. So it's still, they're just still looking at the four counties. That was his big thing. Still looking at the four counties. 
five. Five. Yeah, five. So they included that, okay. Yep. So five, and he said if it wasn't going to be statewide, he just didn't know how he could do it because it would be for everybody and not just a few. I think that was his his main hold up with the whole mm-hmm. thing. But you know, I give I give I don't I don't think the people sitting on this board are the smartest people in in Hamilton County or the smartest people of all the parents in not in Hamilton County. I guess I should say. I give parents a little bit more credit than than maybe some others do. I know a lot of parents that have the best welfare of their kids. So I just wanted to know where it stood. So now it goes back to the House and then back to the Senate again. Is that they bounce it back and forth? Well, both houses have got to pass a version. Yeah, a version, and then and, and then it would go to a conference committee. But okay. It's got to, yeah. It's what the they got to, yeah okay I just didn't know where it was in that in that thing. It's okay. what the finance it's what finance right now and and I would uh, it's supposed to be taken up this Wednesday. Um, I'm not overly it's confident it will be taken up this Wednesday. So it, yeah okay. Um, one one I'm final, waiting on the last version before I pass judgment. Yeah, on. yeah uh, one final thing that um, yeah I, I feel the same way as you you know we'll see how they perfect the bill as it moves forward Rhonda. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do feel like it's critical that we be engaged at each step of the bill because it changes rapidly. Yeah. Um, so one piece that I neglected to mention that is of utmost importance is academic accountability. You know, uh, Tennessee has spent hundreds of millions of dollars over the last decade uh, really aligning assessments. Um, and we could discuss that all day long, but the reality is that that is what our state has chosen to do. And it's impressive to see the way that our students statewide have moved moved the um, bar. moved the bar thank you Steve um, compared to students in other parts of the of the nation and so um, the Senate bill actually removed any type of requirement to take any tea and ready testing mm. it then made an uh, an mm. option to take a more um, a more national test. Um, so that was that's a big difference um, because at that point a parent doesn't really there's no way to do apples to apples when um, just parents. my personal opinion it, it's kind of amazing the amount of data we have now in Tennessee. Teachers say we've got we drown in data. <laughs> um, but because of that, I mean, we, we could set the standard for the entire nation with how we measure the effectiveness of a of a school and a voucher program. So. Um, okay, I thank think you. That's all the big pieces. There, there's no way it's equitable if we don't measure the same way by the same methodologies. There's just no way. I, I, I'll just express my concern that the I, I would a lot of people would feel better if it was kids coming out of failing schools, but they can be in the very best schools in our system mm-hmm. and, and choose to leave. I mean, they could they could leave Sigma Mountain, they could leave Wildwa, they could leave Sunny Daisy High School. And I said Daisy. I said both, uh, but they, you know, they could leave some of the very, very best schools in the system, mm-hmm. and and another thing is the poorest of the kids are not necessarily going to have their needs met when they're looking at a sixty-seven thousand dollar family count for a family of four. Then, then you're looking at a lot of our kids, our poor kids are really well under that, and and they are they don't have the capability. Uh, the seven, what seventy three hundred dollars, Joe? Would seventy three hundred dollars send most really poor kids that, that you deal with? Would that send them to a private school? The ones that are in are really economically disadvantaged areas. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, private schools can accept whatever they want to accept. <laughs> so, right. so a lot of them are going to say, "Yeah, they'd love to have that seventy three hundred dollars." Things really interesting to me. I was I was in a uh, I was in a group with. Uh, uh, some moms the other night. We we do a moms group once a week, and and these moms that some of them have two and three kids are already counting their money, you know, because mm-hmm. they want to homeschool their kids, and they're not a bit more qualified to homeschool their child than I am, and so that scares me. Yeah, you know, that's crazy. But uh, yeah, crazy. I've seen a kid that a kid they may take a seventy three hundred dollars. For a kid that runs a nine five hundred. Oh, they'll take it. I guarantee yeah. they'll take it. Like, like Brian Johnson did when he was that age. But. <laughs> um, I, I think Rhonda touched on this, but I think it's another uh, thing that really struck me that I hadn't quite realized was that if a student receives an ESA and goes to anywhere, a private school or homeschool or whatever it might be, they, uh, we as the 
as the education provider locally would be required to accept that student back, of course, at, at any time. Uh, but the difference, uh, or at least a shock to me, was not so much that the child would be welcome back, because I would certainly expect that to be the case, but if there is any money remaining in that ESA account, um, it doesn't return to the school system with the child. Okay, it, it goes back to the treasury. Yeah, that, that, that's, the, that's one consistent. Really? Not to go to the kids, the kid comes back, the money stays with the kid. Well, it's not where it's going. That's been consistent. And, and the kid will probably come back from anyone, yeah. Because they don't want the kid anyway, because they don't want to so Exactly. They, can't deal, they don't want to deal with that. Yeah. So hypothetically, they could, uh, a private school could remove some of our students that have gone there mid-year. Say if they take 10 of our kids, and then we send, they get back to us, but they keep the funding for the rest of the year, or for the rest of the three-year term? They keep it. They get to keep the money. So if, if the money's spent, so also in the example of a, if a child were homeschooled, for example, once the money's spent, the money's spent without without any kind of accountability for it, right? So if a minivan is purchased and then wow. you realize, wow, homeschooling is incredibly Hard. difficult, yeah. right? Then the money's gone, but the child comes back. And, I mean, then also that child's academic progress is tied to Tender. our yeah. local school. Yeah. And something that I've thought a lot about lately, though, is, is choice and how important choice is. And it makes me really excited, all the great news that's coming out of Hamilton County Schools just today. I mean, that the work that Brian's team is doing with the city to think about and, and surveying our families, to think about Future Ready Institutes and what need there is and how we could connect people with, with transportation in um, potentially innovative ways. The children's um, cabinet, I mean, we're doing a lot to address um, the desire that people have to have choice for their students. So. Um, part of that larger statewide conversation and I feel like we're having a very um, big part in that. Well I still think if we would do a tree, true open enrollment that we should have done about 10 years ago or we should have never stopped it 20 years ago uh, or however long ago is it Put my hand over my heart when I say Jesse Register's name uh, when he was here. Uh, when he stopped the most successful program that we ever had in Hamilton County and we've never been able to get it back. That's one of those things you take away, it's hard to get back. Instead of us deciding which schools we want to be up and enrolled, we ought to do it. This is causing a lot of problems um, because the, inner, the city schools did not want to have open enrollment because they were afraid it would drain a lot of their their schools. And I say let the kids go. This is the biggest problem I have is so many kids are trapped in schools that have been failing for 35 years and they can't get out. That's the, Those are the kids I think about. The other kids are going to be okay. Their parents are going to be sure they're okay. But I do not like the fact that there are so many really good kids trapped in some really bad schools through no fault of their own. Those are the kids that just tug at my heart that really, really upset me. And, and, and even in our system, we talk about all these, well, maybe they don't want to go to magnet school. Maybe their parents can't do the volunteer hours. Maybe they can't do that. Let them go to school where they want to go. Mm -hmm. If there's open, let them go. I don't care which school it is. We don't have to tell them you have to go to A, B, or C school. Let them go wherever they want to go. Uh, and if these, these do-gooder people, that all these philanthropists that want to come and tell us what to do with our money, let them provide them transportation to go where they want to go. That's the way you start helping communities, one kid at a time. Do it one kid at a time instead of us trying to make this thing so complicated. It shouldn't be this complicated. It sounds kind of like that's where, where your team is going. Am I right, Brian? I mean, to look at... You do it in five minutes. We want to from the school board. But, but would it really open up opportunity if the child... If a child has truly been trapped, we need to think of as a community about how we get that child to that Who says they're school. trapped, though? Like, well, I'm quoting I think, using I think, Quan, Rhonda's I think word. the concern here and where it gets sticky is that some kids really want to be at their home school. They really want to be in their school, in their neighborhood or their area, their community. Um, I agree with what Rhonda says, but I also think we have an obligation to make their school better. So then if their school is where it needs to be, then they don't have to really want to go somewhere else because their school is up to par with the other schools. So I think that's, that's a concern, too, because some kids, some kids do want to leave. 
for a variety of reasons when you talk to them. But some kids really want to be at their building, in their school. I mean, some of it's tradition, some of it's family. I mean, it's a lot of reasons why people want to be at their schools. And so they stay there because in those schools that are underperforming, there are a lot of students that are excelling. And they want to be there. They're in the top 10% of their class. They're going on full rides to college. So they're not trapped. And they're not in jail and they're not enslaved. They don't, nobody's making them be there because, trust me, a lot of their friends who live right next door to them go to schools completely across town and their mothers figure out how to get them there. Be it a lot of ways. I'm not going to put that out there, but it's a lot of ways they figure out how to get them other places. So I don't, I don't, want, I don't want us to say that. I mean, everybody can choose their own words, but just let's just be cautious in that because some people are where they want to be. I think very good conversation for us to be having, um, in particular as we enter this time of the year. Uh, this the, the conversation is right. Um, I think in particular as we look at, you know, we added some open enrollment schools this past year. Uh, uh, one thing I think we have to think about as we as we try to um, increase those again going forward is the um, the planning components behind it. So you got to be able to staff them, and then you also got to have space in place form so that it, you, 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 it has to be controlled but uh, we're definitely in support of continuing to expand that going forward um, last few items the Brainerd and central track so with both of these uh, and I'll get your question correct so with both of these um, it primarily is uh, Phil Dirt right Ken uh, yes, sir. Didn't miss anything there um, just um, some unsuitable soil unforeseen but um just a little increase in cost, but um, Justin has worked with the city on the pricing, and we're ready to move forward at this point. Good. So, yeah. so I just have one one question that may be an additional cost that's not listed there, but um, we're really excited about the Brainerd track. It's been a long time coming. It's going to be an awesome track, but nobody's going to be able to watch the meets because they have splinters for seats. Have you all seen the bleachers at Brainerd High School in the track area? You might as well just take a toothpick and stick it up your behind. I mean, they're awful. They're really awful. Like, they're awful. They're like shredded wood. Like, it's they're awful. You can't sit there. And I'm sure, and I know we have some other places that like that, but usually there's no, right, that's what I'm saying. But I'd rather not have any runner before I go ask you to sit right there on that toothpicks. I mean, that, that's bad. Um, so, um, and, and I've talked to Dr. Bradshaw about this. Um, I would hate for us to put all that money into a track and then people are standing around or bringing their lawn chairs, um, chairs in the bag to watch the track meet because, I mean, and Joe's seen the, and they're bad. They're bad. I don't know any other way to say it. <laughs> they're like shredded, like shredded wheat. I, That's what it looks like. Man, there you three. I, I, I understand. I've been in Brainerd track. I, you're, you're correct. Hey, do you have lights? Are there lights around that track? Um, Competitive lights? No. No. The lights at the, the only lights are at the stadium. Mm -hmm. And then we have the parking lot lights in the... So you can't run a night meet there. No. No. See, that's that's the same thing at Central. Central has no bleachers whatsoever. Yeah. And no, none whatsoever. And I know the commissioners ask, the commissioners ask for lights for both of them. And the commissioners, were, you know, Dr. Mackey, was it Dr. No, we Dr. no it, be, it was a... Uh, when Dr. Mackey, who was that for Brainerd? It would be Miss Jeter, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But before Jeter, her predecessor had requested lights, and I know District 9 requested lights, and somehow they got dropped. I don't know how, but I know our community, and I think Brainerd probably too, is worrying about both seating and lights, and, and we can't have a track meet because track meets go beyond yeah. the daylight. and. Uh, and somehow we need to, I just, I, I didn't tell them, I've, I've heard from people in Brainerd and from people from Central that are very concerned that, that we've got a half million dollar track and not able to compete on it because we don't have lights. But I, we need to look at that somehow. 
just put a final pin in that price tag, it'd be about four hundred thousand dollars to do lights on those two, on both of those facilities. And so, it, it comes down to cost. I know when um, you know everything that's going to bid right now, the economy is good. Everything that's going to bid, um, it, it's coming in, you know, how right at the line. Uh, and so we ran into that a little bit with the stadium, even at, at Howard. And so it's just a matter of trying to. Uh, trying to get as much as we can. Uh, we've got a long way to go across the system, and I, and I know um, we'll, we'll definitely take a look at the bleachers. Obviously, the lights are a little more um, complex. I know uh, Brad start putting together an internal uh, facilities listing partnership with, with Justin. Um, you know, we've got some high schools that have uh, sports, one in particular. I know Sell Creek. I didn't realize they didn't have a football stadium until they came in that day uh, when we were approving, when you all were approving the Howard Stadium. So, you know, we, we've got our facilities, if we're going to do athletics and things as uh, extracurriculars just in general, you know, we've got to ensure that uh, that that we do them uh, at very top notch. But we've got a lot of ground to make up in regards to that, um, and in particular with, with – um, uh, with, with these two facilities, these two track facilities. <laughs> I, I will say at Central, there were walking lights there, but somehow they've disappeared. They've gone somewhere else. Do you have any idea where they were taken? They had walking lights, and now they're gone. I, I don't know, but I do know they'll, they'll be walking lights there. Okay, correct. I do know that. Good. <clears throat> we can say just try. Oh, yeah. They had to expand the track. So they moved them. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, but the light poles with the lights on them were have disappeared. I think they had to take them down. They had to take them down. Right. But I'm told they're off the site. They're not on the site. Well, okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bradshaw, uh, they're wearing me out up in Hickson. When are we, we going to see some progress on the tennis courts? Tennis courts. Um, let me get with Justin and they're wearing me out. I'm gonna I'm okay. give him your number. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, yes, I do have my light on because anybody gets any lights before Silver does, uh, you will be hearing from an attorney. Right? Uh, because I'm just about done with this. I mean, they don't even have a track. And they don't even have a painting play a football field on their. They don't have any bleachers. And I'm sorry, but I'm not bleeding hearts down here for you guys. <laughs> you okay? Um, if anybody gets any lights before Sail Creek does, there's some parents just sitting on ready to go, and I'm ready to join them. So. Moment silence. <laughs> I believe her beautiful is. I uh, understand. I understand. I think your your lovely assistant is amening you there, Bobby. I, I was going to say I had to I had to get help so from I think my commissioner and everybody to even get this football field done and go big bar and steal from the mayor to get it done because I couldn't seem to get anything done for this school board. But I will not give in on the lights and the bleachers so they can at least play home games without having to drive from Sail Creek to Finley Stadium. That is a haul for people no. who do, from one end of the county to the other. It's ridiculous. I do agree, and I think one of the conversations we've had even in this most recent uh, building package of uh, East Hamilton Metal, and Justin was here to talk through it, but, uh, but Norma Coppinger has said one of the lessons, one of the things learned, I know what it was, it was East Hamilton Metal High. Um, maybe when they built it, there wasn't a track, and they had to do some things for the field, and it's been, and so what they said, what he said, my, <laughs> So to his point, what he said is, to that point, what he said is there won't be a school built going forward that won't have the package. But now it is a matter of going backwards to address those. And um, and I and I, I will tell you for, you know, high school, I was I was surprised, you know, candidly, that Sail Creek didn't have uh, a stadium when, when we started rolling. So it definitely is one of those things that is extremely high on the list. Um, Justin, textbook adoption, anything? Uh, it's just a matter of identifying. Yeah, it's just State showing the uh, books that were adopted. Majority of this is uh, U.S. history because that's not U.S. history. High school teacher there. Social studies uh, because it's on that cycle. So it's just the ones that the textbook adoption committees are recommending. This is not um, saying that we're going to purchase these. It's just you guys adopting, approving their selection. Are we looking at going to digital? 
you remember, if you remember uh, over, I'm sorry, I got, I, I can't remember what month. It was probably June or July. We went into an agreement um, that that included an online textbook for uh, social studies. So, um, I mean, are we moving that direction? We're in talks all the time. You're gonna hear from the librarians this uh, Thursday in their update that they're looking to go uh, and provide some online access to books through libraries. And if we can partner with the uh, ELA content leads and what we're trying to do in schools for ELA would make sense. So we're trying to look at different ways that we can provide options online. Um, it's where a lot of it's going. I wouldn't say that we're going exclusively that direction. I, I know when I was teaching AP history courses, I taught three of them, and most of the providers will allow the young person, if, if we have a book for that young person, they can access the online version. So they can leave a hard copy text in the school, maybe even a classroom set, and they can do the online at home. So that yeah. would be great in the future. I think most, most of them are going away from that option um, you know that that was kind of in the early days of online text it was a way to get you to uh, entice you to buy I know I was the same way so I'm, I mean thank, thank you sir thank you you're right I, am. I didn't say that so I noticed that a lot of these books are economics government world history um, I've I heard quite a lot of chatter within the community about a concern that civics education has left our curriculum. Um, can you speak to that? I mean, when I see this list of government, U.S. history, I mean, that... Our, our students require by law to take a civics assessment I thought so. uh, before okay, they graduate so. high school. Um, civics is not only built into government and economics, but you say civics is built into every social studies course. Um, but I may ask you to say that again on Thursday. That's fine. Thanks. It's also built into the U.S. history. history right. Very strong. Right. Uh, Jimmy, did you have a science well, I know what I took, but I know that there are large groups of people in our community that are very concerned that our, that students nationally and in Tennessee do not know civics. Yeah. And so I think that it is useful to point out that we are teaching civics. <laughs> I, right. right. Yeah. I, I've been in some of our civics classes, and I mean, the teachers, I've been, I've been in several of the classes, and our teachers do a good job. Oh, yeah. well, and the standards covered. Uh, the one concern I have heard, a lot of people, there's a lot of revisionist history that's in, our, in all the textbooks now. Spoken like a good history teacher right there. <laughs> Yes, yes. Wikipedia. Uh, so uh, that is that is the bulk. There is uh, a, a, a proposed right. We have the pro, a proposed uh, meeting schedule for next year, I believe, right, Sherry? Um, and then there is an appeal uh, that exists as well as those schedule of sessions. Um, and then the graduation schedule on the back, uh, Caritza, we will work on your uh, your doubled up uh, one. We'll have to we'll have to we'll get you there somehow. We'll we'll get you there. Well, we fixed one and messed up the other. We fixed one and messed up the other. So we're we're trying to figure it figure it out. Anything else? As we adjourn, uh, Dr. Johnson, let's remember uh, Jill's son. Yeah, they're, they're still in Houston. Yeah. Very serious surgery. And let's just remember that yeah. family. Yeah. Yeah, he had, uh, well, I bet I better careful to share it, but he did have some, some surgery done and uh, is recovering and hopefully back late next like this week uh they're supposed to be back like this week had to be there for a couple of weeks before they could travel so um sounds like he's on the men we exchanged emails today but a long recovery anything else we had a great meeting today um, with um, Mayor Coppinger and the children's uh, uh, cabinet that was uh, that was mentioned really excited about um about that that opportunity uh, to really align some resources and, and dig into some social emotional supports for students. So uh, with that, budget session Thursday, 4 o'clock.
All right. All right. Budget first.